So this is Janet Papadakos. She's Interim um, Associate Director of the Elixir Center, and she manages the, uh, the Patient Education Program for Princess Margaret. Um, Janet's in the final year of her PhD in Health Services Research at the University of Toronto, um, Institute for Health Management Policy and Evaluation. Over the last 10 years, uh, Janet's research and professional program has centered on three main platforms. Health literacy, which is developing interventions to mitigate the effects of low health literacy. <coughs> Self-management, engaging patients and families to, to participate in their care. And, um, and third is patient education, which is advancing patient and family knowledge. Finding better words for health is directly connected to communication. Without clear communication between patients and healthcare providers, healthcare provision cannot be equitable um, and it can't be optimized. Um, today I'll ask you, I'll talk to you about the impact of health literacy on cancer communication, ask you to think about what it implies for your own work or your own future careers, um, and uh, discuss what changes we can make as individuals to improve cancer uh, communication. I'll also share uh, toward the end of the slides um, some ways and examples to improve cancer communication, things that we're doing through the patient education program at Princess Margaret. So there'll be some very practical examples of what you can do. So the objectives today are to learn about health literacy, its prevalence, and how it impacts health um, broadly and specifically for cancer. And we'll learn about the Princess Margaret patient education program. all up. Okay. So um, a recent article that was published in Lancet, I'm sure you're mostly all familiar with that journal, um, referred to how low, uh, re referred to low health literacy as a silent epidemic, very dramatic. Um, this is because low health literacy is a pervasive threat to the health of many people. Um, low he health literacy is associated with less use of preventative services, um, delayed diagnoses, less adherence to medical instructions, poorer self-management, and um, less ability to navigate the healthcare system, lower life expectancy, um, greater social inequity, high healthcare costs due to such things as more frequent uh, visits to the emergency department, longer stays in hospital, as well as hospital readmissions, um, and in general, poorer health. So people with low health literacy are also less able to make informed health-related decisions and choices. They're also less likely to seek health-related information to know how to do that. Um, and they're also less likely to engage in health-related communications. They're less likely to have meaningful conversations with doctors, to have a suite of questions prepared and ready before an appointment, um, et cetera. Um, Health literacy, there are multiple literacies that are involved in health literacy, many of which I'm sure you've heard of. One of them is functional health literacy, and that's a person's ability to read and write prose. Um, fun uh, there's numeracy, which is a person's ability to use numbers in a meaningful way. And if we think about navigating the uh, nutrition information on the side of a cereal box, that is a good example of uh, numeracy skills. Um, cultural literacy, cultural literacy is um, at the individual level, and it really focuses in on that person, where they're at in life, what their priorities are, and how that impacts their own personal culture. So for example, um, let's say uh, a parent of uh, a couple children maybe prioritizes the health of their children over their own health. So perhaps they don't go to the doctor as frequently as they should because they're busy juggling everything else in their, in their family life or a, a very hardworking, ambitious student uh, perhaps neglects their health and doesn't go for their annual physical exams because they're tied down with school. So that's an example of cult cultural literacy. Um, and then there's civic literacy. And civic literacy, um, you can think of as how do people navigate the healthcare system? How do they know uh, what services are available, what services they might need? And a nice example we have of this is um, our mom uh, needed physiotherapy. She had a frozen shoulder. She's retired. Uh, and living on a modest income. She was going for her physio every day, and it was $100 a day. At some point, she decided, enough is enough. This is great, but that's too much for me on my retired income. And so she saw her uh, physiotherapist and said, wonderful you know, to have known you, but this is going to be my last appointment because I can't afford it. And the physiotherapist said, oh, um, 
you should have told me before, there's a free clinic for, um, for people over 65 down the road. So, and because it was $100 per visit plus $20 for parking. Um, so uh, civic literacy would be my mom's ability to ask those questions and to say in her first appointment, are there any, fr are there any benefits or any, any, uh, any uh, services for retired people? But also, there's a civic literacy end on that healthcare provider, on that physiotherapist, who also should have told her or offered that information forward or somehow assessed whether or not that information might be helpful. So that's civic literacy. That is just four dimensions of probably about 20 different dimensions of health literacy. So I hope you can appreciate that it's a rather complicated construct that can have a profound impact. So if we look at health literacy in Canada, low health literacy is extremely common. Um, over 60% of Canadians have low health literacy. And if we focus on seniors, people over the age of uh, 65, it's 88% of them have low health literacy. Um, and this is health literacy being measured uh, using a validated tool that mostly focuses on functional literacy, so reading and writing, and numeracy. So it's not even looking at the other parts. Um, so since the majority of people um, who are in the cancer system are over 65, it's cancer generally mostly affects people who are over 65, um, the majority of patients and family members that we see in Princess Margaret in the cancer program will have low health literacy. So it just should be an expectation that we have. Um, so let's zero this in into Toronto. This is, well, this is a heat map of Canada that shows the health literacy levels across uh, the country. The fire colors, so red, yellow, and orange, indicate the areas with low health literacy. If we zoom into Toronto, um, the area that's in the center that's sort of, uh, can I point at it? Is there, is there, can you see that? I can't really see it. Oh, there. This area here is around University Avenue, so downtown Toronto. It's red. Um, that, is, uh, that means that um, over 82% of the population living downtown Toronto, over 82% has low health literacy. Um, so if anyone, if you hear this, we hear it often when we do consults with health professionals to build education materials or to build teaching tools. My patients don't have low health literacy. There's a very strong chance that that's not correct. Um, so, um, and we'll get into why people may think that in a few slides. So, um, as well as having a negative effect on health and the quality of life uh, of individuals, low health literacy also exacts a significant financial toll in Canada. In 2009, and the reason it's 2009 is that that was uh, when the census was discontinued for a little while, now we're back, but the, the, we didn't have data uh, from that point onward. Um, but in 2009, low health literacy in Canada cost an estimated 3 to 5% of the total uh, health care budget for that year. Um, this amounted to approximately $8 billion um, in excess health care costs due to low health literacy for all the reasons that I mentioned in an earlier slide. Delayed diagnoses, less compliance or adherence to medication regimes, more admissions to hospitals, longer stays, all of these reasons. So just to give you an idea of where that number comes from and really how unnecessary it is. Um, oh, and, and being diagnosed for cancer at later stages of disease. I guess we spoke about it. So this is the definition of health literacy um, that we use in the patient education program. Uh, would anyone like to read it out in Aquile? Would you like to read it out loud? I like to mix it up with my voice. <laughs> um, so this definition uh, is an evolving definition, but it is a pretty solid one to, to sort of ground ourselves in for this presentation. Um, this, was, uh, this definition is from 2011, and it's from the Agency for Healthcare uh, Research and Quality, the AHRQ in the United States. Um, and uh, it includes all of the sets of skills that are necessary for people to function effectively in the healthcare system. Um, so if we think about civic literacy, cultural, and all of those other parts coming together. Um, there are uh, more recent constructs of health, uh, that incorporate, uh, of health literacy that incorporate the healthcare provider into a health literacy framework. And this recognizes that healthcare providers bear a significant responsibility um, in the exchange of health information. Oftentimes, 
um, more often than not. Um, training programs do not um, include educational learning theory, adult learning theory, or communication-based competencies, or if they do, it's a very brief module. And so healthcare providers are sort of on the hook to be expert educators and expert communicators, but they're not given the training to do that, or really the time to build those skills within their busy clinical schedules. Um, other definitions of health literacy emphasize the unnecessary complex nature of our healthcare system, the way it's fragmented, how you have different specialists for individual parts of your body or different diseases you have, rather than a more holistic system. Um, in addition, um, they cite the lack of providers' time and lack of training, and then they focus on also the patient's deficits uh, in terms of their ability to read and write and that kind of thing. Um, so that's just another type of conceptualization, but more recently, um, and this has been born out of a recent roundtable and um, some recent publications, is a recommendation to sort of reconsider how we think about health literacy to focus on roles. So if we focus on the role of the patient in their own health, if we focus on the role of the healthcare provider in patient's health, if we think of the role of the healthcare system, that will enable us to think more about how can we build structures within hospitals, within programs to support those roles rather than taking the sort of negative approach and studying deficits, uh, which hasn't happened yet. So this is a great new way of thinking about things that will probably lead to building up supports to build provider competencies, to um, build uh, supports to build patients and that kind of thing. So um, since it's widely accepted that patients, providers, and health systems have a role to play in health literacy, effective communication in cancer is a clinical and a public health priority. In recent years, I'm sure you've probably noticed, there has been an increasing focus on improving cancer communication to enhance prevention, detection, and treatment in cancer. Um, cancer Care Ontario has started their personalized screening campaign. I don't know if any of you have seen those, receiving letters at home. Um, probably not, because many of you are very young, maybe not. Um, the Ontario Public Health Association with Canadian Cancer Society has launched, launched their HPV vaccine campaign. Um, and Colorectal Cancer Canada holds its annual giant colon event and the Get Your Butt Over Here uh, screening campaign as well. Um, this is a really big change. Most organizations and government have never reached out on this scale to really communicate with patients about prevention and detection. We also see that healthcare providers are more focused on improving cancer communication to reduce disparities in the utilization of cancer services and developing ways to clarify risk communication, improve conversations about treatment options, and access um, to clinical trials. Um, our program, Patient Education, is busier than it's ever been with healthcare providers coming to us for help. Um, but most of these efforts toward more effective cancer communication, um, unfortunately, health literacy is still being overlooked not when they work with us, but. <laughs> um, so uh, this picture was purposely chosen because it's a dated image, it's quite an old image, um, just to show that despite that organizations and government are on board to do these things, they're still not considering, uh, this is still a significant problem, this is still a problem that patients are, and providers are not clearly communicating with each other. So if we think about um, the increasing options and the complexity of cancer care, and cancer care requires really high level, high order um, health literacy skills um, with regard to decision making, symptom monitoring and management, etc. then health literacy is even more important, I think, in the context of cancer and other complex diseases. Oops. There we go. So how do we know who has low health literacy? Um, we can't assume that patients with low health literacy are easy to identify because they're not. Um, most individuals try to hide it. It's something they're ashamed of. Um, many people with low health literacy are well-groomed, articulate, intelligent. They can hold um, high-level positions. Um, they can even be um, healthcare professionals in some, in some capacities. Um, we can't tell and we should, um, because we can't tell who has low health literacy, we need to use a universal precautions approach. Um, and this assumes that everyone that we deal with in the cancer system has low health literacy. Um, in the context of complex cancer care and considering our elderly population, this is a responsible way to proceed. Even those who have high health literacy or uh, marginal health literacy, they'll appreciate clear communication, especially when they're um, under distress or if they're fearful, as they often are in cancer.
So who are the groups that are at highest risk for low health literacy? So although health literacy is very common in our context across Canada, those who endure the greatest struggles with low health literacy um, skills are often older adults, members of the Aboriginal population, recent immigrants, um, people, people with lower levels of education, and um, individuals with uh, low English proficiency, um, and also those who are dependent on social assistance. And the implications of these more vulnerable groups is that limited health literacy often correlates with a lack of ability to effectively self-manage health, um, access health services, understand available and relevant information, and make informed health-related decisions. So um, a large proportion of Canadian families are immigrant families. This is especially true in Toronto. Toronto Central Lynn, which is where we are, is the first home for recent immigrants and refugees to Canada. Um, this means that Torontonians struggle with limited English proficiency, a vast majority of us. Um, residents come from over 200 countries and they speak over 160 different languages and dialects in Toronto Central. So this can make it appear that low health literacy levels are associated with immigrant groups, but it isn't, that isn't the case. Low health literacy in Canada is associated with lower English proficiency. So this study here that's up um, is uh, examined the predictors of health literacy among older Chinese immigrant women to Canada and how colon cancer information presented first to them in their first language versus their second language, which was English, um, affected their health literacy skill. So only 39% of the women had adequate health literacy based on a validated measure of health literacy um, and 54% had adequate comprehension of colon cancer information comprehension of the cancer information was significantly lower among women who received the information in English compared to those who received the information in Chinese. As such, lower English proficiency patients um, may be highly health literate when information is prevented in their, presented in their own language, but when, when it's presented in English, they can have low health literacy. So this is really important, particularly we're, we're um, in a healthcare system where there isn't a lot of uh, access to translated resources and interpreters are difficult to um, book, particularly if it's a last minute or emergency situation. Um, and there is much literature that supports this finding. Um, so here's a, a little bit of a look at the evidence for the effect of low health literacy in cancer. There's not a lot um, of published literature on this topic, but this is just a little summary. And, um, there's strong evidence that low health literacy is associated with less use of pre preventative health services. So um, low, people with low health literacy are less likely to have mammograms. They're less likely to have pap tests, less likely to have colorectal cancer screening, and they're also less likely to use sunscreen. This means that those with low health literacy present with more advanced um, cancers and that individual, than individuals with marginal or high health literacy. And that's a very high proportion of people in Canada. This is a slide that talks about health literacy and um, radiation therapy, which I know Annette, who's an advanced practice nurse educator who's here, um, will maybe find interesting. Um, and also actually Aaliyah, who's a radiation therapist. Um, this study examined whether socio-demographic factors predicted whether patient, patients would refuse radiation therapy. And the findings showed that the socio-demographic predictors of refusal of curative treatments were those that are associated with low health literacy. So for example, advancing age, low income, and new immigrant status um, meant that you were more likely to refuse curative radiation therapy. This suggests that patients with low health literacy also may be more likely to refuse curative treatments. Um, this has important implications for cancer communication. What factors might contribute to the underutilization of curative radiation therapy among low health literacy patients? And what can we do to mitigate this problem? Um, we'll discuss mitigating strategies in the next few slides. But if we think about that, um, I know uh, uh, we did a similar presentation with radiation therapy therapists, and um, they shared that they, uh, patients express a lot of fear um, of radiation therapy, and, that, and not having the ability or the comfort level to ask questions to a healthcare provider or to communicate, to share your fears so they could be allayed, would mean you're not asking those questions, you're not getting the information that you need in order to make the decision to move forward with treatment. So it's a pretty uh, <clears throat> gloomy portrait I've been painting, but there are many things we can do in our everyday practice that can mitigate the effect of low health literacy. You can't change someone's health literacy level within the context of health. That would require taking people back to school, teaching them how to read, learning how to write, developing communication skills. That's not gonna happen in the context of healthcare. So that's why there are strategies to mitigate its effects rather than strategies to improve health literacy. Improving health literacy needs to happen 
in the education context uh, in school, not, not in healthcare. So um, for patients with low health literacy to understand cancer information, there must be a match between the patient's language, logic, and experience, and the information that they're getting. As such, it's important to use plain language to align your clinical logic um, and experience with a patient's logic, so whatever the clinical information is, and use multiple modalities to reinforce really important learning objectives. So I'll get into each of these bullet points in the next few slides. So um, we talked about using a universal precautions approach. So this is assuming that everyone um, that you interact with in, in the healthcare system has low health literacy. It's not dumbing it down, it's just being clear. So to support the practice for effective patient education, or um, we have to follow universal precautions, which takes really specific actions to minimize risk for everyone when it's unclear who is health illiterate. Um, and so you can use plain language and a variety of teaching tools to explain information to patients. Use videos and illustrations to reinforce what you've said. Um, that's particularly helpful um, if for individuals who can't read or have lower reading skills. Use multilingual resources. Um, we do have a few multilingual pamphlets at Princess Margaret, but very few multilingual vid videos, which is something we'd really like to work on. And also to work with interpretation and translation services. There are a number of grant opportunities available um, to staff at Princess Margaret and throughout UHN to apply for funds for translation for really critical uh, safety-related um, education interventions. So plain language is um, a science that really needs to be mastered by anyone working in a healthcare system. Um, it's uh, both verbal skills for plain language communication and also written skills. Simplifying materials makes them more appealing, less intimidating, and easier to read. Um, however, when they're used alone, a simply, so if you're just giving someone a simply written plain language pamphlet, but you're teaching at a high level, there's not a congruency there and it's difficult for people to follow what, what the message is. Multiple studies um, that document patients' misunderstanding of common medical terms, um, for example, show that um, this is between uh, examined transcripts between patients and physicians in uh, interviews. They found a very high variation in the comprehension levels of cancer terms among patients. Almost all patients, about 98%, understood the word vomit, but only one, uh, only, um, one third of these people understood orally and 13% understood malignant and terminal, only 13%. Many words that we consider to be everyday language when we work in the cancer system um, that are not clearly understood by the general pu public. Um, and uh, we do hear often that patients didn't know they had cancer. So people with leukemia or someone who had a tumor or a growth um, didn't actually realize they had cancer. Um, so while physicians, um, in this particular study, physicians reported that they thought they were communicating in plain language, um, the nurses who were working with the physicians at the time um, said that the language level was extremely high, reported back that the language level was very high, um, which, isn't, which isn't surprising really because there isn't a lot of focus on plain language communication in the medical curriculum yet. I think that will change. Um, oops. Is it? No. There, okay. Um, an often unrecognized problem is the mismatch in logic and experience between patients and healthcare providers. Healthcare providers' uh, scientific and clinical background is based on facts, probability, and their previous clinical experience. Um, and as a result, they tend to give detailed factual um, information that's organized according to a medical model with the goal of increasing a patient's knowledge on a topic. Um, more often than not, a patient's logic and experience will be very different from that of a healthcare provider. Um, so for patients with low health literacy, detailed factual information, it's not going to be very useful or relevant to them. Um, patients with low health literacy tend to be more responsive to information that's based on the health belief model, where priority is given to patient action, um, motivation, and self-empowerment. Patients, especially those with low health literacy, are more interested in information that improves their sense of well-being and helps them to solve real and immediate health issues for themselves. So they're not so interested in knowing that they and 60% of Canadians have this condition. They are more interested in what does this mean to my daily life? Um, how are we going to treat it? How long is it going to last? That kind of thing. Um, so um, in order to... Um, uh, mitigate that problem, uh, you can, whoops, let me go back to that slide. Limit information, uh, the content of what the patient wants and needs to know 
rather than focusing on facts and stats. Sequence information, number it for clarity so people have an understanding of an order of things to come. And chunk it, include similar topics together. Um, you can also use effective design and layout for written materials. So if someone sees um, a, a document with a lot of writing on it, someone with low health literacy, they'll be intimidated and are very unlikely to pick it up. But if you ha even if you have the same amount of content, but you space it out with a lot of white space, large font, um, and uh, you, you use one, one consistent font, no more than two, avoid bold, avoid italics, that kind of thing, the patients who are intimi usually intimidated by something like that will be much more likely to pick it up and take the time to read it. It's not as uh, intimidating. This is uh, an example to show you of uh, what a patient might hear during a visit with their oncologist. Leah, could you read this one? Yeah. Can you see it okay? Do you want to go? Sure. Sure, thanks. You have cancer of the large intestine. It has spread to the liver and may be making you feel tired and to have a low red blood cell count. We would like to treat you with a new drug that works well for this type of cancer. Which one did you guys like better? <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a good example of a plain language uh, edit of what would be a complex. Now, people who work in cancer care, many of us are very familiar and comfortable with the first paragraph. Um, but for most people who have very little experience with cancer, the second is much better. If I were sick, I would, and, and even now, I prefer the second over the first. Um, this next slide just shows um, an, a couple examples um, of plain language in other areas of health um, that I'll just show you for a few moments just to give you a, a good idea of what that looks like. It's not dumbing it down. It really is just uh, using words with fewer syllables, uh, fewer than three if possible. Um, and avoiding medical jargon, et cetera. And difficult letter combinations like a PH for a F sound like physician, doctor's better. People with low English proficiency um, would find that challenging uh, to read because it, it should be an F if it's physician, uh, for example. So why is this important in healthcare? Um, this is, as we know, a very significant problem in Canada. Um, communicating in plain language can increase patient safety. Uh, it reduces medication errors, reduces ER admissions because people know how to identify problematic symptoms be before they're exacerbated to the level of going to an eMERGE. Um, patients, when they're signing consent forms, actually understand what they're consenting um, rather than coming back and reporting decisional regret. Um, it improves outcomes. Um, low literacy and numeracy skills are risk factors for poor health. Um, it helps people to understand what their role is and what they have to do. And we know that the supports around roles are very important for improving uh, or mitigating the effects of low health literacy. It saves time and money. It reaches more people, plain language, and it increases satisfaction, both from healthcare providers who, who have the confidence that that person who they just spent time with knows what to do when they leave and they're not worried, but also to that patient who goes home and has a sense of control over what they're to do next. So now, I'm just going to spend the next 10 minutes talking to you about the patient education program at Princess Margaret and some of the things that we do in our work to mitigate the effects of low health literacy by working with healthcare providers and also um, providing services to patients. This is a snapshot of some of the um, patient and family resources that are available in our program. Um, we have workshops and e-learning modules. I'll talk to you about a few of those. Um, pamphlets for patients and family. Pamphlets are still considered the number one desired um, education resource for um, patients in healthcare. Interesting fact. Um, we actually wrote a paper that we just published this year called The Persistence of the Pamphlet. And although we didn't want to believe it because we thought, well, oh, web-based materials could reach more people, videos don't require the ability to read, pamphlets are still number one. That may change in the future, but, and it may be because pamphlets are more likely to be written in plain language well video and websites may not be there yet. That might be the reason. Um, we have uh, library services and a number of other things, but I'll take you through those specifically rather than looking at this cube. 
Um, so some of the courses and um, education opportunities that we have available um, that also are available to you if you'd like to take any of these programs. We have an e-learning course on um, plain language writing. And um, my sister Tina and her group have just recently changed that module. It used to be one hour and it was dense and it was heavy and it was sort of exhausting to complete even though it was fascinating and wonderful. It was a beast. She has now reduced it into four smaller modules. So you can do them at your own pace. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Um, and that's available to everyone. If students want to access the learning management system, though, please do contact Tina or Grace, and we can connect you. You'll need to have special access. They have them on server, actually. So they can have them on sandbox, just on the web, kind of a web-based version. You can email and they'll have them. OK, great. So we can circulate that if you'd like to take it. We can talk maybe about getting a certificate for that, too. That would be pretty great. Um, we also have a, a course called Maximizing Your Patient Education Skills. And that course is a, a wonderful, intensive um, half-day workshop where um, we have standardized patients in for simulation. And we teach, um, we work with healthcare providers. It's a course for healthcare providers to learn clear communication techniques. It's a pretty fun workshop. It really gets your adrenaline going because you're kind of put, in, put on the spot to interact with um, standardized actors who are acting like patients asking you questions. And you need to try to practice what you learn in the workshop. It's quite great. And that if you want to do that for an intact group, let me know. We'd love to do it for nursing. Um, we also have a health literacy and adult learning principles um, course that we do, um, a face-to-face -face workshop on plain language where you actually get to practice plain language writing, and we also have a workshop on teach back. We have a number of other courses as well, but this is just to give you an idea of some of the strategies that are out there. Um, the patient education program also works to develop materials um, with healthcare providers to augment the teaching that they do in clinic. We also we create pamphlets, um, posters, signs, um, teaching aids or teaching tools, um, and we have a medical illustrator on staff who can create illustrations that help to convey meaning um, to what you're sharing. All of the pamphlets in our collection are on the intranet page. If you're interested in looking at some of them, you can find them here. Um, Okay. Um, we also have uh, our patient education intranet page. You can access patient education videos, pamphlets, um, library services, etc. here. So you please take a look at that too if you like. Um, how many of you have seen the patient and family library on the first floor of Princess Margaret? Great, almost everybody. Many people walk by it and they don't, they don't see it. Well, that library is part of the patient education program and it's run by a consumer health librarian who specializes in um, plain language, providing plain language resources to cancer patients and their family. So you can feel free to pop in there, talk to Michelle, she can show you, give you a tour of the collection. Actually, or Katie, because Katie has spent a fair bit of time in the library as well over the years. So you can pop in and say hello if you'd like to have a tour there. We have a number of uh, different modalities of resources for patients and family to help them learn about their cancer, cope with side effects, etc. find support. Um, and there's also computers in there for patients and family to use if they want to search for health information or even e email a friend, connect with work. Um, we have other tools that are available um, to help with professional practice, so for healthcare providers to leverage. Uh, one of these things is um, we have um, uh, access to interpreters for any patient education classes. So um, with no charge to the clinical program, no charge to the patients. Um, so any of our patient education classes, we have quite a few classes that are offered through um, Princess Margaret. They're all listed, you can't really see it there, in a calendar of events. Any of those are available for free for people to take with an interpreter. That's a picture of the calendar of events you can find in the library out here on your way out. Um, we also have um, easy listeners, which are devices to facilitate face-to-face uh, -face interpretation. So if someone wants to attend a class, um, we would book an interpreter to come, and then that patient and their family member would wear these headsets so that, so that all of the um, other individuals in the class don't hear the uh, translation in Chinese, in Mandarin, or whatever it happens to be. Um, but they have the advantage of being there face-to-face -face with the um, healthcare provider who's teaching the class so they can have their specific questions answered. This is just a snapshot of some of our pamphlets. They all look like that when they're developed here uh, with a blue band on the side. Uh, and this is just an example of some of the translations. Um, we also work very closely with, uh, under the Cancer Education Program with the Web and Digital team. And um, they uh, often work with us to translate existing patient education resources into more accessible formats. So we have a hard copy version of the Cancer Journey Binder, which is given to every patient at Princess Margaret who's newly diagnosed. It's a beast of a resource in a three-ring binder. It's very dense, very thick. 
um, Web and Digital, just actually in April, we're able to launch um, the Cancer Journey app, which is an app version of what would be that very cumbersome, large, heavy tool. Um, so this is available now, and there's, uh, there's a snapshot here of a smoking cessation for individuals uh, who, who smoke but have cancer that Tina's program developed um, that leverages um, content that's very tailored and specific to cancer patients to help motivate them to quit, help them understand the benefits of quitting before starting treatment. We also provide a number of services, so um, patients uh, can come to the library and access information. The librarian is there to help them um, really find the information that they need, even if they don't know specifically what they need or they're not able to really express it because of low health literacy and civic literacy issues. Um, so she's trained and has really perfected that ability to sort of have a conversation with someone, a very casual conversation that prods and prompts to find out what, what supports and services might help a person. Um, we also work with healthcare providers. So a staff member could come to us and say, I work in the head and neck clinic. Um, my patients are always asking about X. I don't have any resources. Is there anything out there? So our librarian will do a search to find out if any other cancer centers in the world, or English, usually in English, uh, have, have developed something on that topic, share it, and then we can leverage that for use for Princess Margaret, either by adapting it or bringing that resource in. Um, we also um, provide a, quite a service to the community organizations like Prostate Cancer Canada, Ovarian Cancer Canada, by bringing them into the hospital so that patients can learn about the supports of these organizations you know, earlier, sooner rather than later, so they can access those services. Um, just uh, throughout Princess Margaret, you may see small areas like this, mini libraries located throughout the clinical uh, areas, all the ambulatory clinics and the inpatient units. These are really mini libraries that are tailored to the patients who are seen in that particular clinic. And if you don't know, Princess Margaret is organized by disease site. So all the breast cancer patients go to the breast clinic. That's where they see their radiation oncologist, medical oncologist, surgical oncologist. And so the breast clinic has a mini library that's dedicated to resources for breast cancer patients. And that's the same for 26 mini libraries throughout the hospital. You're welcome to check those out too. Now you are at Elixir, and um, this is home to um, the cancer research and, uh, CRS, Cancer Research Rehabilitation Survivorship Program, as well as the Patient and Family, edu uh, the Cancer Education Programs. Um, and so here at Elixir, you can access a variety of programs that are offered through Cancer Rehabilitation and Survivorship, as well as Patient Education. So we have a number of classes that happen here. Um, so if you saw the boardroom over on the other side, that's where we offer a lot of the classes for patients, which is really nice. It's a good room, comfortable chairs, private with good sound. So it's a, it's a good environment for learning. There's also the small library out here that focuses on cancer wellness um, and survivorship and a number of other areas. So patients are welcome to come here anytime to sit and relax in between appointments and connect with each other. So thank you for your attention, your comments.